Okay, good evening. Session three of Unlocking the Bible. Tonight we're going to do a practical exercise in exegesis. Before we kick off, any big thoughts or questions from last week? Nothing? No questions? Means either did really well or really badly. Okay, so exegesis means to lead out or to draw out. It means to, to take um, a text and extract meaning from it. The, we should move from eisegesis, which is where we bring our own thoughts, imagination, emotions, predilections, and preferences to a text and, and use that as the filter through which we read the text. In the exegesis um, approach, what we do is we take the text, we read it in its context, and we draw meaning out of it from that, using all of the rules of hermeneutics that we've discussed thus far. So tonight we are going to look at a text. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has over, not overcome it. That is an incredibly dense piece of, le of uh, I almost said legislation, of uh, text. It's in the Gospel of John. And we are going to explore that tonight. And we're going to do so with reference to a couple of ideas. First, you remember in session one, we spoke about the uh, five W's and one H, the questions that you ask when you interrogate the text. I'd like you to imagine that you're a um, police officer, detective, you have a witness or, or a potential perpetrator of a crime. You do what? You interrogate them, you ask questions. And you ask questions with, with, a, with a purpose, and the purpose is to draw out of that person what happened, what is this all about. So we're going to ask a bunch of questions, and in this case, just to, to see how it works, I'm going to extract some answers. Who wrote the book? Now, there are a couple of Johns in the New Testament. Was it John the Baptist? No. No. Yeah, correct. John, son of Zebedee. We know it wasn't John the Baptist because he was beheaded. Um, it was uh, John, son of Zebedee, or one of the sons of thunder. And he is, he is known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He rested his head on, on the chest of Jesus in the Last Supper. Um, he is, is the one who wrote uh, the book of Revelation. And he is, he is certainly a very prominent figure in the Gospels. What kind of book is it? Any ideas? Gospel. It's a Gospel, yeah. So it is a, a Gospel, the Gospel according to John, which comes alongside the Synoptic Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels are primarily narrative. They primarily talk about what happened to Jesus in a linear fashion. They talk about what happened on the ground. The Gospel of John is slightly different. It's, it's known as the mystical gospel because it, it, it has more of a heaven to earth perspective. The other gospels, the synoptic gospels, have an earth to heaven perspective. So it is known as the mystical gospel. When was it written? Any ideas? There's a bit of controversy about it, but any thoughts? It was probably written in the 90s, the first, um, in, in the 90s of the first century AD, or common era. Um, it was certainly, almost certainly written after 70 AD. Why do you think that that is significant? It, it does. It does, it does bring that to bear. But in 70 AD, AD, there was the rebellion of Bar Kokhba, which resulted in the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And we read, if you read the Gospel of John, you'll see there's a whole lot of emphasis on Jesus being the true temple. And that would have been highly relevant in the context 
of the temple in Jerusalem having been destroyed. To whom is it written? Identify the specific person, if applicable, or the likely audience, if not addressed to an individual or specified group of individuals. So if we're reading a Pauline text, a Pauline letter, it's usually quite easy to tell who Paul is writing to because he tells us in the first chapter. This is one of the Gospels, so how do we know to whom it is written? Any ideas? Nope. It is written primarily to a Jewish audience. We know this because there is extensive and repeated reference to Old Testament text throughout. In fact, there's, a, there's, there's an expectation that whoever reads this gospel is extremely familiar with the Old Testament. Um, it's, it's quite different to the, the synoptic gospels in that instead of speaking about a whole range of miracles that Jesus performs, it focuses on seven miracles. And each one is highly significant and, and is, is rich in significance to, to Jewish people, to the nation of Israel. Welcome. Why was it written? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, he was, he was certainly one of the last surviving, um, if not the last surviving, disciple. And, and it was important to, to present to the Jewish people a complete argument on why Jesus was in fact the Messiah. And it ties in, it links ra rather well with um, the book of the Revelation of John. What is it about? So what is it about in general and in detail? Now you'll recall that one of the tips that, that we discussed in, in reading the Bible is that we should understand a verse in the context of its, of its chapter, in the context of its book, um, in the context of where the book is in, in the range from Genesis to Revelation, where it is in the history of Israel, where it is in, in, in the, the history of the church. So all of those Factors are relevant in determining the context. And what we said was that it's a good idea to read the whole book and the whole chapter before you start to try to understand the particular text. Because it, it makes more sense that way. So I'm going to tackle this text on the understanding that we have all, for the purpose of, <coughs> for the purpose of this exercise, actually read the whole book. So we can understand this text in its context. So what is it about in general? So what is the book about in general? Not just the text. What is the book about in general? Well, <coughs> unlike most books, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> in, in the Bible, this one's quite handy. It actually says it's the gospel of the glory of God, which actually describes itself. So what is it in general? It is a... Um, a gospel that focuses on the relationship of the glory of God with the rest of the message of the text. What is it about in detail? Well, it's, it's a, a narrative description of the Messiah Jesus, seven, seven miracles, in the context of some really, really big themes in Scripture, and how Jesus fulfills those themes which are, are first found in the Old Testament and come to their consummation in the New Testament. There are other ways to, to describe it, but I think that that's probably not a bad summary. What is the central theme? I've just told you. Glory. The glory of God. Yeah, the central theme is the glory of God. Um, I'm going to look at this in a little bit more detail when we get to the text itself, but... Glory, or the glory of God, is the radiance of his character. It's the outshining of what he's like. It's, it's the communication by radiance of light and, and splendor and holiness of, of what God is to all of the universe. And we're going to look at how that plays out. 
Where does the book fit into the meta-narrative of Scripture? What is the meta-narrative? Remember, we discussed this in the first week. The grand narrative, the big story. Remember, we discussed that, that one of the, the um, approaches that we can adopt to the reading of Scripture, to hermeneutics, is to consider it not only through the lens of, of systematic theology, which deals with um, theological themes and then slots scriptures into it. But we can also look at it in terms of what is the big story? What is the whole story from Genesis to Revelation? What is the story of, of Jesus on earth from his birth to his death and resurrection? Those are all stories. What is the story of the church from, from its birth in Acts all the way through to now and, and heading into the consummation of the age? Where does it fit in those those individual strands of the grand story. And finally, how does it fit into the kingdom narrative? So Jesus uh, preaches almost w without exception about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God in all of the Gospels. So how does, how does this book fit into, <coughs> into that framework of the kingdom of God where is it? How does it demonstrate the kingdom of God? What does the kingdom of God look like in, in the Gospel of John? And what does it look like in, in the text that we've selected? <coughs> what I've done here is I've double-clicked on eight. So you can double-click on any one of these and spend a whole lot of time in one of these. For the purposes of this evening, I've double-clicked on eight, the meta-narrative, the big story. I've drawn here <coughs> from the <coughs> division by, by um, Scott McKnight, an American theologian, of the big story into four discrete or, or four distinctive phases or, or movements in, in, in the Bible, four phases of human history. Um, Scott McKnight, this is from the book Blue Parakeet, which I recommend. It's an easy read, and it's a really, really great uh, basic guide to hermeneutics. Really good. The first theme is oneness, God creating icons. If I say to you, what is an icon? You've, you've heard the expression icon before, yeah? Iconic. An icon. An icon is an image. So in many religions, an icon would be the representation of a god. So, so in the meta-narrative of Scripture, we humans are described as image bearers of God. We are God's icons. We represent Him on earth because we look like Him. And we are made in His image in many ways. So in, in the garden in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, Adam and Eve are created in the image of God. They are his icons. They represent him well until the fall. In Genesis 3, they become cracked icons. So you imagine an image, and the image has now got a fault in it. That's the fall. And in, in Genesis 3 to 11, the theme of otherness creeps in, how, how God is now different to those who he's created in his image because God is without sin and they have sinned, they've fallen away. Um, and, and all of the horrors and all of the disadvantages that accompany the fall then become part of that story. In um, the third phase of the big story, the covenant community, Genesis 12 to Malachi, that's the vast majority of the Old Testament. Uh, the theme is that otherness expands. Even though the law is given, even though there's the Abrahamic covenant and the Noahic co covenant and, and the Davidic covenant, all of these engagements of God with, with humanity and with Israel, actually the otherness expands. And, and in Malachi, we see um, it, it ends with the, if, 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 if people are no longer, or Israel is no longer in, in right standing with God, he will smite the earth, the earth with a, a curse. And then there's 400 years of silence where God doesn't speak. And then Matthew. So 
the, the theme of the covenant community that's Israel being called out and given the law and yet there, it's, it's a struggle and, and the fulfillment of the, of the great promises given by the prophets are not yet fulfilled. Then Christ, the perfect icon, redeems in uh, Matthew to Revelation 20. Jesus, we read in, in Paul's letters, is the perfect representation of what God is like. He, ex he is the exact image of God. He is the exact icon. Now, in, in Near Eastern um, religions, an icon or an image of an idol, which is another, another kind of icon, um, would, would be imbued with what that God is like. It would be in, uh, become a God that the people could carry around with him. If that, that God breathed itself into the idol, and there would usually be rituals and, and ceremonies performed that would depict how that would happen in many ancient religions. And that's an, that's an image, it's an, a representation of the moment in the garden where God crafts the icon Adam and breathes his life into Adam's nostrils. It's, 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 we speak of the Bible being inspired, it means in breathed. And that's what happened. Adam was breathed in God and became alive. Um, that is a forerunner of what happens at Pentecost. In Pente at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is given to, to the believers and are, they are inspired by the Holy Spirit. They become filled with the breath of God again. And the breath that was lost in Genesis um, returns in Matthew. Well, actually in Acts. The, the promise is revived in, in Matthew and, and falls in, in Acts. The final phase of the story of this grand meta-narrative, the consummation of this, the tale, the, the grand story, that we, the conclusion of the grand story that we're heading towards, its consummation, is described in Revelation 21 to 22, um, where God gathers all things in Christ himself, and there's this image of, of a new heaven and a new earth, and a city that descends, and, and there are all kinds of images in the description of the ultimate city of the marriage chapter of the Lamb of all of these things. They are symbols and they speak of the consummation where we, as per the, the high priestly prayer of, of, of Jesus in John chapter 17, um, become one with God as God is one with himself. And we become one with one another as God is one with himself. We enter into the dance of the Godhead in a very real sense. So that's, that's the promise to come. So if you wanted to double click, you could then say of this, this scripture that we've looked at, uh, John chapter one, verses one to five, where does it fit in this lot? Well, ac according to what I've just said, it fits here in this section because it's, it's fourth after Matthew, but it also fits here for reasons that we're going to, to examine. It's actually a very interesting little crossover text. What is the ultimate goal? So here what I've done is I've, I've, I've double clicked on this perfectly one and I've considered, well, how are some of those themes incorporated? In Galatians and in John, oneness in Christ is the goal. In Galatians 3, we read, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, no, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That doesn't mean that genders don't exist. It doesn't mean that um, at that stage there were neither slaves nor free, or there was no ethnicity of Jew or Greek. They were saying that there is, there is, no, there is no legal distinction which places one above the other. The, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. And, and that's especially um, true because in, in each of those, 
Jew nor Greek. If you were Greek, you'd think that the Jews, the Jewish people, um, felt that they were spiritually superior because the law was given to them. Um, the um, Jewish people may believe that, but would say, from a political perspective, the Greeks and the Romans are, are oppressing us, so we are in a, a socially more vulnerable position. Um, slave nor free, well, obviously, slaves were, were massively disadvantaged from a power perspective. Male or female, women were, were incredibly prejudiced from a social perspective. There were a lot of rights that they didn't have that, that men did. You are all one in Christ Jesus because all of those power constructs no longer have any value because we are all one in Christ. So that's the consummation of the oneness in Christ which we're heading towards. John 17, verse 17 to 24. This is part of the high priestly prayer of Jesus. Um, which, I, in, in my view, this is the peak of, of Mount Everest in the Scriptures. This is, this is the snow-capped, um, most rarefied, incredibly potent expression of the love of God in, in the mouth of Jesus in this prayer. Jesus says, Sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world... So I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. And that's important because um, we're going to go back and have a look at that word, word, in a minute. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So this is the oneness that we're heading towards. Father... Uh, that they may also be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you've given me, which is the whole of the Gospel of John, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me, which is a profound thought. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you've given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. There's, there's so much in that text, I'm, I just don't have the time and space to deal with it um, tonight. But, but this, this is the consummation, an expression of what the consummation will be. That is the goal of oneness in Christ, which is described as the final phase of the meta-narrative. So why am I dealing with all of these things? Because we want to place this gospel and this text in that gospel in the context of that vast, overarching meta-narrative. Any questions before I continue? No questions. The next section is going to get a bit of a wild ride. Four, identify scripture that will help illuminate the text. Genesis 1, verse 1 to 5, in the beginning. Where have you seen that before? In the beginning of John. In the beginning of John. It's the very text we're looking at. So, so if I say to you as Christians, for God so loved the world, he gave his only saying, so that would not perish but have eternal life. Or participate in, in the divine life of the age to come probably a better translation. But, if, but this is not written to, to Christians. This is written to Jewish believers. And to Jewish believers, if you start a sentence that says, in the beginning, this is what they say. God created the heavens and the earth. So John wasn't, wasn't making an error here. He was, he was conflating, he was juxtaposing two very important ideas. He wanted the Jewish readers to read those words and immediately go, this is the creation story. We're about to hear about creation. And, and we're going to look at that in some detail in a moment. But it, it's important that the questions we've asked at the beginning, who's this written to, now becomes very, very, very important. Because if we don't get that, we're going to miss the whole point of what he was getting at. It's literally the point of the story. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. So without form, it, 
it didn't have a shape and void, it wasn't full. It didn't have people on it or animals or anything else. And, and, and that's important because what it was, was he was describing a canvas that hadn't yet received paint. And we're going to see when we look at the Gospel of John in the same texts that that idea is repeated. Um, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we've got, we've got God and the Spirit of God operating at the same time. And God said, let there be light. So he said something. When, when you say something, what do you, what do you use to express ideas? Words. Words, yeah? Remember that, we're going to come back to it. So God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called it light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Interesting for the sun. The sun is only created later. So, so bear that text in mind, because we're going to go back and have a close look at it. When we take all of these ideas and go back and exegete the text. This is simply to get you thinking along the lines of, well, when I, when I, come, to the, when I come to read the text, what are the, what are the tools in my toolkit? What have I got? Stephen King, the horror writer, who's actually a very talented novelist, wrote a book called On Writing, in which he described um, how to write a book, how to write a novel. And it's also an autobiography. It's an excellent book. I strongly recommend everybody should read it. It's, it's really interesting. Quite a lot of swearing, but it's, it's an interesting book. And he describes a scene in the book where he was a young boy, and he was at his uncle and aunt's house, and his aunt said to, the un to his uncle, please, will you fix the screen door? And his uncle said, sure. Went to the shed, picked up this massive wooden toolkit with, with folding layers as you opened it up with, with every tool imaginable in it. He went and he picked up his toolkit and he, he brought it to the screen door, opened it up, looked at the screen door, took out one screwdriver, fixed the screen door, put the tool back, closed it up and put the tool kit back in the, the shed. And Stephen King asked his uncle, he said, if you only needed one screwdriver, why did you bring your whole tool kit? That doesn't make sense. And his uncle said, well, you never know what you're going to need. You better have your toolkit with you. And, and, and reading the Bible and engaging in hermeneutics, engaging in exegesis, is exactly the same process. We're not going to use every tool every time, but it's really important that we've got our toolkit with us. To draw out those tools and to use the right one to extract the most meaning at that time. Exegesis should place us in the position that, that we understand the text at least in the same way, at least, if not more, but at least in the same way that the original audience would have understood it. And that requires a bit of discipline, requires a bit of work, and it requires the right tools in our toolkit. It, we, we have an incredible um, advantage. I don't want to say tool because that's the wrong expression. We have an incredible advantage that our reading of Scripture our exegesis, our drawing out of meaning, is not a solo mission. We have the partnership of the Holy Spirit who illuminates it as we read, who works it into our hearts and minds, and who reveals things that, that we wouldn't otherwise get. I don't know whether you've experienced this. I've experienced this many times, where I'll have a text that I've read a dozen times or more, and I've always got something out of it, but then suddenly you read it, and, and it's like the cosmos unfolds before you and you see all kinds of stuff that you've never seen before. And that's God participating in the exegesis of the text with you. So, so actually reading the Bible is such a profound privilege and such an exciting adventure when we understand we're not alone on the journey. Sorry, I digressed a little bit. Um, another way of, of approaching a text to understand it in the context is to look at, at similar um, texts in, <coughs> in other books. 
So what I've done is here I've taken the, the beginning of the Gospel of Mark to see how it lines up. How is it different? How is it similar? Are there, are there over, overlapping themes? Are there overlapping ideas? What, what is similar? What is different? And where are there differences? Why are those differences there? <coughs> One of the reasons I chose Mark is because the first few words actually express a similar idea. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So the Gospel of John starts in the beginning. Here we have the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And <coughs> we know, pardon me, <coughs> it's not COVID, I've got a sinus infection. Um, we know that the Gospel is not just a, 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 a key to our personal salvation, just say this in his prayer. It's much more than that. Gospel or good news is not a, a Christian term. It's been assumed into the Christian vocabulary. But, it, but it's a, a eugelion um, was a word that was well used already when Jesus arrived in the Greek-speaking world. It referred to um, great news, usually of a victory. But it was, it was news that changed the world. And what would happen is if a, a Roman general won a, a great victory, messengers would go out throughout the empire and would go to every village and would go to every town and go to every city and declare the good news of that victory. So when Jesus and, and, and his disciples speak of, of the kingdom of God's advance, arrival and advance, in terms of good news, the original hearers would have understood not um, just my personal prayer for salvation. They would have understood, hang on, there's a great victory. World-changing events have transpired. And this affects the way we're going to live forever. Something has shifted, not just for me, but for the world. So Mark starts the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Um, Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. The Messiah, that's, that's, a, that's a king who's coming to reign. This is the herald of a new age, a supreme master. The world has changed. We read it because we're kind of used to it and, and we've, we've become inured with the words of the gospel. But actually, this would have been, this would have been incendiary fire um, to the first hearers. The people who read this would have said, are you saying that Jesus is setting himself up against the Roman emperor who is God on earth? Are you saying that we're now pledging allegiance to a different kingdom? We may die over that. So... So if we, we read these, these things in the context of the original hearers, the original readers of the, the texts, it's, it's actually a lot more explosive. This is, this is like an atom bomb going off. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, so, so, so Mark is drawing in the promises of the Old Testament. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Who's he talking about? John the Baptist. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So, so I would say, if you look at that and, and the Gospel of John, they're radically different. And yet they, they're actually talking about the same event. Jesus breaking into world history. But from a different perspective, it's a different angle. So, so now we've, we've gone through all the preliminaries, we've thought about different angles, we've, we've considered some of the tools at our disposal. What do we practically do? One, we meditate on the text. Actually think about it. You know, part of, part of the challenge of living in a, an environment where we have in a day, we have more information rushing at us than someone in the Middle Ages would have experienced in an entire lifetime. And because we have so much data coming at us, data coming at us, data coming at us, it never ends. Um, we really just sit and think about one thing. That's not something we do often. But to stop and and experience the, 
the privilege of, of just focusing on one thing. I heard John Piper, who's one of my favorite authors and favorite speakers, brilliant man, speak in uh, Chicago on, on his testimony. And he said that as a young man, he suffered from two incredible disabilities, crippling disabilities. The one was a crippling shyness, which, which was so severe that for most of his um, school career, he could only ever do talks, orals, one-on-one -on -one with a teacher, and even that was a, a, a traumatic event for him. And one day, his teacher said to him, if you don't do your talk in front of the class, I'm going to fail you. And he got before God, he was the son of, a, of an evangelist, got before God and he said, God, if you <coughs> get me through this, if you help me talk today, I will preach for you for the rest of my life. So what did he do? He finished, he got through it, it was difficult, it wasn't easy. Got through it and he um, went to study, not theology, but I think um, biology, science. And he became very, very, very ill, very ill. And he, he spent weeks lying in the infirmary of the university. And, and what would play every day was this um, Bible teacher. And, and he, he lay there in his bed in, in extreme discomfort and he became more and more convinced that this is what he was, in, he was called to do. <coughs> so he, he swapped out his career, um, started studying theology, went and studied theology in Germany of all places and, and became um, an incredible influence on the Western world of theology. Incredible man. So his first great disability was that he couldn't speak in public. You know, we are so hardwired to think of our effectiveness in the kingdom as being aligned to the gift that we have. Actually, God says that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Um, God, God took John Piper, who was a weak orator, the weakest of orators, and made him probably one of the most effective mouthpieces for God and in-depth thinkers about the gospel in the world today. So, so, so we shrink back of stuff because of our weaknesses, because of our inabilities, because of our limitations. And, and God says, that's the very vehicle I need. So, <clears throat> you know, yeah, effective and bold. Fearless, in fact, I would say. So that's disability number one. Disability number two, he reads really slowly. Like, tragically slowly. He says if he reads a book in a year, other than the Bible, if he reads a book in a year, it's a, that's a lot. Because he can read only, he can't read fast. As somebody who reads really fast, I think, gee, that must be such a disadvantage. So he said this, I'll never forget it, he said, when other people are reading, it's like they're flying over the orchard <coughs> while I'm wandering through the orchard, plucking oranges, tearing them open, and biting into the fruit, feeling the juice dribble down my chin. And, and I thought, what a picture of, <coughs> pardon me, man's Weakness being made perfect, you know? So, uh, uh, when John Piper speaks, he'll, he'll dwell for, for, for ages on a word, or on a sentence, or on an idea, and he spends so much time on it. And, and I heard somebody say of him that he's like a dog with a bone, he worries it. He worries it to get as much marrow out as he can, you know? And, and there's, such a, there's such a profound truth in that that if we just stop and slow down, we're gonna see a lot more in the text than if we just read it, because what we've got to do is get through, through, through a chapter a day, or 10 chapters a day, or whatever it is that you've set as your goal. Now it's good to read a whole book quickly, not saying it isn't. But once you've done that, go back and read the text, read it slowly. Be like John Piper, 
read it slowly. So in the beginning was the Word. We're hearing the Genesis story, talking about creation. The Word is Logos. It's the smallest unit of thought as a word. The, the, the Greeks would also interpret Logos as reason. In the beginning was, was the reason. Was, was God's purpose made manifest. And the word was with God and the word was God. Now, now we, we say, hang on a second. How can the word be God? Well, because Jesus was present in the creation story. When God spoke, it was his word bringing things into being. And, and Paul says, not one thing was made. Um, sorry, not Paul. What am I saying? John. Not one thing was <laughs> made without Jesus exercising his creative power to bring it into being. So, so we start thinking, well, that means if I read Genesis 1, God was present. John says Jesus was present. Genesis says the Holy Spirit was present. Where have we seen this before? Where have you seen that before? Where have you seen the Father speaking, Jesus present, and the Holy Spirit? Where have you seen that? Jesus' baptism. So we, we have an echo of creation and the baptism of Jesus. Why are those things important? Well, we're going to start thinking about that because there are themes of water in the Gospel of John. You can't throw a stick without hitting water in the Gospel of John. You can't throw a stick without hitting light in the Gospel of John. And, and in the Gospel of John, we see that the division of light and dark isn't just physical. There's a supernatural element to it. Why do I say that? Because we go on to see that the life is the light of men, because Jesus is the supernatural light of men that we require to see the world as it truly is, because light is the thing that bounces off stuff, bounces into your eyes, and without it you can't see. Revelation is the, the moment when light strikes an object and enters our eyes. Without, without light, the things that are hidden cannot come to be known by us, because we need light to, for it to be revealed and seen. So. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything that was made. In him was life. In him was Zoe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believed in him would not have perished, but would have Zoe. Divine life. Not just bios, the process of breathing and eating and sleeping and dying, but Zoe. Divine life. The opportunity to enter the dance of the Godhead. The opportunity to experience the divine life of God now, while we're yet among the dead, who haven't yet breathed their last. So, so, so John, is, John is saying a lot of stuff here, and it, we, we haven't even got to verse 6 yet. He goes on to say, the life was the light of men. Why? Because it, it illuminates what we are in our fallenness and what we could be in God. Because when light shines on something, you see it as it is. Who's, who's walked through the house at night not putting the light on because you don't want to disturb anybody? You've done that before? Okay, yeah? Have you hit furniture? Yeah, <laughs> I do every time. When you hit furniture, it's because light hasn't shone on it, so you can't see it's there. There's a stumbling block that isn't apparent. And that's what happens. Light shines on it, and we see the stumbling blocks. We see what needs to be overcome. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. What do I mean by that? What does he mean by that? Well, how much darkness does it take to overcome light? Darkness is the absence of light. Darkness is the absence of light. There's no amount of darkness in the universe that can overcome a speck of light. So if you weigh evil, darkness, against light, the glory of God made manifest in Jesus, who's going to win every time? Or, put slightly differently, if darkness is the absence of light, then the presence of light dispels darkness every time. And, and John goes on to say in, in, in the high priestly prayer of Jesus that we receive the light of God, we receive his glory, and we therefore illuminate the darkness the same way that in Genesis... God spoke and created 
light and dark, night and day. When we, when we understand the Gospel of John in the light of Genesis chapter 1, we understand that Jesus, creative power that spoke the universe into being, makes that glory manifest in those who bear his image to carry the light to the furthest corners of the cosmos, the known world. In fact, we read in Philippians, I think, that, that the purpose, of, one of the purposes of the church is to, to make manifest the glory of God, the wisdom of God, the, the, uh, the, the unsearchable riches of God, to principalities and powers, to supernatural beings beyond our sight. To say, hey, this is what wisdom looks like. Us. That's a wild thought. It's really, it's a crazy thought. So, so you could spend maybe a minute reading this text, if you read fast, a minute, maybe. Or a lifetime. And every time you revisit it, there's more and more and more. You know? So, so I'm hoping that, that part of the process, part of the journey of this course is that we start getting into the habit of plumbing the depths of Scripture, of, of seeking out the treasure in the pages, of, of really bringing to light everything that's there because we have the glory of God manifest in us, illuminating our eyes and helping us to see the things that were always there but that were hidden. And, and in so doing, we reflect him better than we do now because we're transformed into his very likeness as we behold his glory. And a lot of that glory is made manifest in his word. Um, Jesus said of the scriptures that it's the scriptures that speak of him. And he was speaking about the Old Testament. How much more when, when the Logos, Jesus, speaks the rhema, the spoken word, of God. So there's lots to learn there. I wanted to ask you, um, I know that Kathy spoke last week about we're always taking things, we're not always saying, but sometimes we can be, one of the um, things that we shouldn't be doing is taking the Bible in some context very literally. Um, and then to what degree how that how that affects us in terms of the way we where we, we we grow or the way we interpret something. So how do you go about saying, well, is this is this something that, that I can pass pass by yeah. um, and I don't have to take it literally or this thing I should be taking literally? That's such a great question. So the first rule, the golden rule, is what do the words say? Do they make sense as they stand? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and, and if, if we read the Old Testament, in fact, let me do that. Let me show you a text in a way that you may not have thought about before. And I, am, I promise you I'm going to answer your question. Just going to quickly look up a text. In uh, Exodus chapter 3. No, that's not the one I was thinking of. Oh. Well, well, let's 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 just let's take this one. I'll use. The, I had another example in mind, but we'll use this. 
Chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord, when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Now, this says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. So the angel of the Lord is the fire, or is in the midst of the fire, in the middle of the fire, right? And then it says, um, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. So just reading the words, is that a crowded bush? Do we have the angel of the Lord and Yahweh? No, in the bush. Moses is in the bush a little bit later in the story. Do we have Yahweh and the angel of the Lord, or is the angel of the Lord and Yahweh the same person? We don't know. But if you read a little bit further, um, it says, uh, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place in which you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then Yahweh said, I've surely seen the affliction of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. I've come down to deliver them. And so it continues. And then the rest of the, the conversation is, is Moses speaking to God. Now, if you just read it, you might think you've got the angel of the Lord and God in the burning bush. But actually God isn't described as anything but the angel of the Lord in that text. Even though there's a flame of fire. And then later in Exodus we see that there's a flame that goes ahead of the people of Israel, the presence of God. Um, and and that, that is referred to as the presence of God. It's God, but it's his presence in a different way. And while that happens, God speaks to Moses. So <coughs> if, if we come to that, that scripture without an understanding that actually God is a triune being, and is manifest in more than one way in the Old Testament. You know, there's, there's a text where, where the Bible says that the word of the Lord came to Abraham. Abraham. And then says, um, and he took him outside and said, look at the stars. So, so if the word of the Lord is just a voice that he heard, how did he take him outside and show him something? So there's actually a person. So, so once we, we approach that text in the understanding that actually the, the Bible describes um, God appearing in more than one form, the angel of the Lord, the word of the Lord, Yahweh, all of these, these different expressions. And we also see um, in Solomon the, the Holy Spirit falling on the, or the presence of God falling on, on the priests. We start to understand, actually, when we, when we read these texts, there's more than one interpretation available. And, and we then start saying, well, let's understand this text in the, in the context of other texts. And then, then sometimes we can read it absolutely literally. Other times we see, well, it's actually informed by different perspectives. Um, I would say where language is very obviously figurative, trees of the field clap their hands is a good example. Well, that's, that's obviously an image. Sorry? It's, it's ants. It's ants, yeah. <laughs> uh, Tolkien is never wrong. Um, to the nth degree. So, that was so wrong. I'm so sorry. So, 
so I don't think that we, we're going to run into trouble most times by, by taking a literal approach unless it doesn't make sense. When it doesn't make sense, we we'll look at other things. Um, but again, as Cathy said, we've we got to read scripture in the light of scripture. So my, I'm really tired. I think I've just lost the example I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah. They would meditate on the word of God and then they what, what does it mean? Such a great question. So, w generally, if you hear meditate, you think of, of, of emptying your mind. That's, that's what most people would say. If, if you're in a, a Far Eastern religion, that's what people do. They just empty their minds and they become one with whatever, one with themselves, or the universe, or whatever other thing you want to fill in. Um, to meditate on the Word of God is to think about that Word, to, to think about the text and think of its implications. For me, I do my best at meditation in the shower. Because I have, there's nothing else. It's just me and my thoughts. I also have my best arguments in the shower. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's a space where, where you can unlock your mind, un, un, unhitch the things that are attached to your mind that weigh it down and occupy it. And just think about it, and think about its implications. Um, I, I also do that in the ocean. For me, to bobbing around in the ocean, I often think of stuff that, that I wouldn't otherwise think of. I think, oh, yeah, that's actually quite cool. But to think about it, just think about it. Because the more you think about it, the more God will reveal stuff to you. Just think about it. So, so to meditate is not to enter your mind. It's, it's to take measures to still the internal noise and the external distraction that keeps us from properly engaging with the text. It's, it's in a metaphysical sense to be where your feet are while you're reading or thinking about a verse. Because again, there's so much data coming at us all the time from so many different angles that we multitask, which is actually not multitasking, it's just dividing our attention over a span of different tasks. And and it, it's, it's actually focusing on one thing. One of the reasons I believe that, that God emphasizes rest so much is because the day of rest was intended to be a time where you had the space without the demand of work to think about the Word of God, think about what He's like. Because you can't think about that when you're busy thinking about other things. You need to actually stop. And, and rest, rest is a privilege. Um, I remember, I, I th I've told this story several times before, so if you've heard it before, please forgive me. I remember listening to John Piper speaking to a group of pastors. I think I was the only non-pastor there in Pretoria. And um, one of the pastors at the front stuck his hand up. <coughs> John Piper was talking about uh, fighting for joy and, and the pursuit of God. The guy put his hand up and he said, but, but how do you fight for joy? Now, I knew that Pipe had actually written a book with the subtitle, How to Fight for Joy. Now, he's, he's literally written a book on it. So it was, the perfect, it was like a softball. It was like an underhanded softball. He's going to smoke this thing out of the park. And, and Pipe did this. He, he stopped. He took a breath. He looked up. <coughs> and he was about to pour forth. And, and I, watched, I watched God stop him. He, he, he stopped, he looked down at the guy, he said, are you sleeping enough? Are you eating properly and do you exercise? He said, man, if I'm tired, I'm no longer a Christian. Why aren't you sleeping? You're not God, go to sleep. And the whole, everybody in that, in, it was dead silent, except for Rory, who sounded like a, Hippo giving birth, because he was a green. That's what he does. He grunts loudly to agree. And he was sitting next to me. I thought I was going to fall over. Um, but, but he said this, guys, you, you are staying up late, worrying about things and working on things. And he said, you're not God. God near the sun does not sleep. You get some sleep. And I've often thought about that. I've thought about how much rest and how much access to God and his fullness, and his word, and his fullness, and his spirit, and his peace, and his joy. 
do we deprive ourselves of because we stay up too late and we worry about stuff we have no control over and we, we spend our energy on, 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 on entertainment and stuff that actually has no material value and no eternal consequence whatsoever. Just rest. You know, Jesus said an interesting thing about rest. He, he, he heals someone on the Sabbath and, and he's nailed by the Pharisees who say, you shouldn't be working on the Sabbath. And he says, who among you, who among you, having an animal in, his, in distress, um, wouldn't, wouldn't pull it out of the mud? We would all do that. And, and he was saying, humans are worth more than animals. And then he says these words. He says, I'm working and my father is working. And this is the Sabbath. Now they get very upset because he's making himself equal to God. But... But there's, there's another little point that's lost there, and that is God is working, even though he's in the eternal seventh day, his Sabbath rest. Because rest in the ancient Near East meant your enemies are conquered, and, and you'll see all over the scriptures, um, their, their, their necks are the footstools of the gods. So, so God is in a state of eternal rest in that his enemies are vanquished, but he's working because there are those who need to be pulled out of the mud. Or as David would put it, out of the miry clay, out of the pit, out of those who would seek your life. So in one sense, God is resting in that he's, he's, conquered, he's conquered and his, his, his feet are on the neck of his enemies. But in another sense, he's working because there are those who are in profound distress, who need to be pulled out into life. So, um, so rest is not passive. Rest is to rest from our own works for our righteousness sake, to rest in his work and to do the thing that he's called us to do in a way that reflects that he is God and we are not. It's a very convoluted way of answering your question, but I hope you got it. Yeah. Mm. What resources are available for to kind of get some of it? Because a lot of them are, are fairly straightforward answers. Like it was written yeah. by, X, by John to this people. Most commentaries will have that information. The ESV uh, Study Bible con uh, Commentary has that. The New Bible Commentary ha will have that. Uh, I use Craig Keener quite a lot. His uh, contemporary commentary on the New Testament is excellent. Um, David Stern's um, commentary on the, New, the Jewish, Jewish New Testament is excellent. So there, there are a range of sources. Don't use Google. <laughs> Google is full of nonsense. Any other questions? That's a great question. Thank you. So most, most Bibles at the beginning of, of a book have a little blurb. It's, it's usually very good. Yeah? Yeah. Getting too distracted in the other stuff, or is that is that good? Is that well, it, it can be good. I there, there are two things I would I would say. The first is, let the text speak first before you look at the sources. That's really important, because because God needs to have the first bash, you know. Um, but but secondly, always come back to what is what does this text mean? And what would it have meant to the people who first heard it? That's not to say there isn't more in it, but at the very baseline, what's that? So, so the Jewish reader in the first century, in 90 AD, the first person who heard this read aloud. In the beginning, he was already in Genesis. And... and and was the word, and the word was with God, his mind's exploding. And he's saying, John, what are you saying? Is this Jesus? <laughs> Is this Jesus? Um, so, so I think the thing that grounds, up, grounds us is, is what do the words mean? And how would it have been understood in the context at the time? And, and, and finally, uh, how are we going to apply it? What, so what if the, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God? So what? 
What does that mean? What is, how does that change how I live today? How does it change what tomorrow looks like? Well, it makes a profound difference if we understand that, that the light that spoke forth all of the universe now lights me up. That changes things more than a little. So, yeah, I think, I think the other thing that ground, grounds us is application. One more question. No more questions. Cool. Thank you so much for your attention. Much appreciated. Next week, we're probably going to look at um, some of the wis wisdom um, texts, Psalms and, and Proverbs. And we're going to see, um, and, and potentially some apocalyptic texts, um, to see how should we read this. I'm actually quite interested in, in looking at Ezekiel. 37, because I'm not sure that the Charismatic Church in particular does that very well. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. But we're going to look at some other texts. I thought this week we'd start with an easy one. We'll look at the Gospels, um, see, see how to exegete that, and then next, next week we'll look at some other stuff. Cool. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>